Welcome to Strength Roots Podcast, presented by Hyperthrive Athletics, where we dissect the mindsets, stories, habits, and tactics of elite performers. Strength Roots Podcast, the growth starts here. Welcome to the first episode of the Strength Roots Podcast, presented by Hyperthrive Athletics. Today, we have Braden Bishop. I think it's good to let people know who you are, what you're doing now, briefly, and then just take them back to the beginning. So for me, like where I would like to start is just what was childhood like? What was family like? You know, where are you from? Um, Just start from the beginning and, I mean, wherever that takes you. Wherever that takes me. Um, So I was born in Los Angeles in the Valley. Uh, My dad was a police officer in East LA, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit, but my mom was a movie producer, movie executive. Um, so, you know, right at the height of the, you know, when movies were, you know, a really big deal, there was no Netflix and it was pretty much all theater movies. So, um, lived there for two years until the big earthquake in LA uh, and then the Rodney King riots. Uh, my dad was actually in those riots so you know I was too young to really remember but I'd probably be freaking out if uh you know if I could remember uh then we went up moving to Palo Alto in the Bay Area um my dad went from Montebello which is East Los Angeles to um Los Gatos Montesorino which is like one of the most wealthy areas (laughs) and one of his first I mean he's dealing with you know gruesome like the worst of the worst in East LA and then he gets to Montebello and his first call was for a loud pool sweep and he thought it was a joke so he didn't go to the call <laughs> and then later on in the you know in his shift like he gets hey did somebody ever check on that pool sweep and he was like what what did I get myself into like this isn't police work it's like babysitting so um really different for him and then my mom wound up uh you know kind of doing movie stuff but not as much you know it's harder in the bay area compared to la la is the mecca for you know movies Mm -hmm. and acting uh and then when we were in the bay area that's kind of where my love for sports really blossomed i mean obviously you know from age three to ten that was like prime to play every sport so um, luckily my mom was an athlete, you know, she ran track at UCLA and then my pops was a baseball player. So he played at UNLV for a little bit, wound up getting hurt, but they were always pushing my brother and I to play, uh, every sport we could. Um, and then we wound up moving to Vancouver, Canada, uh, when I was 10 for my mom's job and uh that was different <laughs> you know going from the bay area to canada you know hockey and lacrosse are like their biggest sports so going from like baseball and football <laughs> and then there's none anywhere that was tough but i kind of had a love for hockey that grew you know my dad worked in the nhl for a little bit when we were in the bay area so i kind of grew up around hockey and play what did he do with the nhl so he worked on the players association side And he was a director of security for the San Jose Sharks. Mm. So that was kind of like, it wasn't his full-time thing. But since he was right there, um, it helped, uh, you know, get to know the players, like, at such a young age, like, be around a professional sport. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that's kind of what pushed me into wanting to be a professional because I saw, like, what it was on a deeper level. And, you know, it wasn't all, like, glitz and glamour. NHL's a little different you know, and on the West Coast, it's a big deal in Canada and the East Coast. So it was cool to grow up around that. How long were you guys out there for? In Canada? Yeah. uh, Three and a half years. So when I was, got there like 10, 11, a little bit of 12. And then uh, my mom ran the Vancouver Film School out there. And then we wound up moving back when I was 12, which is probably a good thing, but uh, because I don't know if I'd be (laughs) playing baseball if we didn't move back well and I think there's all you have like a habit of um 
not, just not talking up yourself. And mm-hmm. I've heard like some crazy stories about you and hockey. Oh yeah. And like <laughs> something ridiculous about how many goals you scored when yeah. you were like, how old were you when you were playing? Let's see. I was, so I kind of play, played growing up. I got on skates when I was five. That mm-hmm. was like the first time I'd ever skated. And you know, it, it came like supernatural, like skating. I mean, if you, yeah. you can see, if you go to like a Christmas rank, you know, in like San Fran, like <laughs> that you see dude just people. going around straight killing yeah, it. Right, right. When and was then, the last time you skated? Um, oof. It was a while ago for maybe like a year. year so and if half. you like lace them up right now, you'll get out on a rink and shred. Yeah. He still, yeah. he still claims to this day that he would be able to play in the NHL. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's like a hundred percent factual but (laughs) but I know like if I had kept playing you know because I think you know if you could skate and like change directions um you know obviously if you go to a hockey game and like you sit close to the ice you'll realize how like fast those dudes are and you know and so it's pretty much like if you could skate and you could handle a puck like you could probably play for a while Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably where my speed came from. Hmm. Um, and, you know, like I said, they take hockey serious in Canada. So, like, I was 11, and I was waking up at, like, 5, getting to the rink at, like, 5.45, on the ice at 6, like, 6 to 7, training, but, like, skill work, mm-hmm. and then go to school, and then after school come back and have, like, real practice. Yeah. I was like, that's serious. I'm 11. Yeah. So. Yeah. And were you playing baseball during that time? So since it, like, obviously the season, like seasons are more extreme up there. Yeah. I would say baseball lasted maybe two and a half months. Yeah. So and I mean, much. as an 11 year old, mm-hmm. especially with parents that are like play everything. Yeah. Like it was play the season and that was it. Yeah. And so, then when, when you got back to the Bay, did you play hockey at all? So actually, there's a kind of, I mean, it's interesting to me, but uh, we got back and I just come off like the season where I scored like three goals a game for 80 games. But yeah, trick. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm 11, so it doesn't really matter. But uh, so we got back and the closest, we were in Palo Alto, or no, sorry, we moved back and moved to San Carlos, which is close to Palo Alto. Um, but the closest team that was like a, like, good team that traveled was the San Jose Junior Sharks and Mm -hmm. they were 45 minutes from us and then that was no traffic and if you're going to practice on a Wednesday in the Bay Area like you better leave at noon to get there at 6 30 so the we I knew somebody who had played on a team and he was like yeah just you know his parents were like yeah come out we'll talk to the coach you know, and any time you're like, oh, you got a Canadian kid coming in, I'm just going to claim Canada. <laughs> but, like, if you have, you know, you have a Canadian kid, it's like, oh, like, he must be legit. You know, it's like if you bring like, a soccer player from England to yeah. the States, like, he better be legit. Um, and so I get there, and we hit traffic, so we were late, and I'm 12 at the time, and we get there, teams on the ice. So, like, I'm a 12 year old. I'm like, God, I don't want to be embarrassed, you know, like be the new kid that like comes late and like comes on the ice and everyone's like, who is this kid? So I like get in the, the locker room. My dad's there and he's like, change. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. And he's like, what? And I'm like, I can't. And like, I looked back, I'm like, God, I was so soft for that. Like I should have done it. But I was like, no, I can't. I don't want it. I don't want to play hockey anymore. And I think it was more like, me being scared to like mm-hmm. get into like an uncomfortable embarrassing situation where like I don't know anybody they don't know me um so I'm sitting in the locker room. my dad's like all right well if you leave like you're done like you're done playing hockey and I was like I'll just play baseball wow like I don't I don't want to play hockey anymore so that was the last was time it. you stepped on ice that was it that was the last time I stepped on ice and like full yeah full gear so we wound up leaving and then I gambled Try to play baseball. Yeah. And it was probably a longer road because mm-hmm. these dudes in the NHL get there at like 18. <laughs> um, and there's less minor leagues, but I mean, it worked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You kind of touched up on 
the fact that when your dad was working with the NHL, um, that was kind of the first time you realized you wanted to be a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. So do you remember like a specific time that you realize like during that stage, all right, this is what I want to do is be a professional athlete. Like, do you remember a specific instance or something? You know, I, like obviously as like a fan or like somebody who's not a professional athlete, you see like only games, <clears throat> but I would be around the practice facility as like an eight year old. And so like you see these guys and I, I don't think I appreciated like their process and like their work but you see like all these different drills and stuff that you obviously don't see in an NHL game. Like it's too fast. Um, but <clears throat> you'd see them like slow it down, like through each drill. And as an eight year old, like I can remember that. So it was like, like I said, you realize like there's a much deeper level mm -hmm. like than just games. And yeah, as I grew through baseball, it's the same thing. Like, you break stuff down mm -hmm. like on such like a micro level that that's like where you like fall in love mm -hmm. with like the little things. So you were like really intrigued with the process yes. of becoming exactly. like just that stud. Exactly. And you, you know, like um, I remember one of my favorite NHL players was this guy named Merrick Schwatos and he played for the Colorado Avalanche um, and he passed away unfortunately, but he uh he like had everything he was fast he could shoot he could handle he's you know he's from uh europe so like his that they call him dangles or just like unreal and uh like i'll never forget um just how like because my dad's best friend was the head coach of the avalanche so like we would see him when they come into town and like you like i mean i was eight but yeah. you could see like what showed up in the game was because of what he was doing in practice. Like, he didn't just show up. So, like, that's what intrigued me most was, like, okay, if I want some to show up mm -hmm. during game time, like, you got to work on it. And yeah. that was, like, the first time. So, like, as a 10-year-old in Little League, you know, I'm carrying over that principle, you know, and I'm in the cage when I don't have to be in the cage. And I, you got people asking, like, dude, you're 10. Like, why are you in the cage? Mm -hmm. You know, like, just play it's like, nah, it's not, it's more serious than that. Do you think um, if you wouldn't have seen that and had that example, that like you would have prepared like that? Or do you think it was because you saw a guy like that preparing like that? Um, I th you know, I, I was l super lucky that both my parents and like my mom was an alternate for the Olympics. so. Like, she had this work ethic that was crazy. So, like, I think I grew up in a household that was, like, more on the, like, push the limit side rather than let's be conservative. And so I think that had a big part. But I think also the situation, like, you know, w what I was surrounded by was, you know, elite hockey players. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that... It had it definitely had a big piece in like the puzzle of like why I wanted to do what I did and and like the way I did it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like example of parents and like household, and then like and my parents did not give my brother and I like anything. Like it was like you earn it. There was no, you know, there was no like here's money, you know, like go buy some candy. Yeah. <laughs> it was like no, you better earn it, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the way that they kind of groomed us, which was good because I don't really like to like owe people things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather earn something and not be given it and then have to like reciprocate it. Um, but yeah, I'd say the surrounding and then my parents. That's awesome. So going from, so that's, uh, you were about 10 years old at, at this time. Um, so then, like, looking at, like, Little League, do you, were you kind of, like, the, the best player on your team all the time growing up and then, like, leading into high school? Like, what was kind of the evolution from that time at 10 years old where you're, like, the guy in the Little League batting cage and, like, yeah. the dads are looking at you like, who is this? Yeah. This little robot kid. Right. Um, 
so like what was kind of the evolution of that going into high school and then did you have that same preparation in high school um kind of what was your level like compared to the other kids at that level and then when did you like really know that you probably had a shot to play pro ball when i so when we were in canada you know like i said like literally it's like two months like when it starts that's baseball when it ends that's it like Nobody did extra because, I mean, like, if you think about it, like, their biggest sports were lacrosse. Like, that's their national sport. And then hockey. And then soccer's super big up there. So, like, baseball was not that important. So, like, I'm coming from California where baseball is, like, huge. You know, the Giants are everything. And so we get up there and, uh, you know, it's December. And my dad's got me out there catching fly balls and like taking ground balls in the snow. Like, so that's when like people are like, what, who is this? Like baseball isn't even cool up here. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, I, so my first year I was a nine year old and I was like, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what they called it, Whether it was like triple a, it was like below the majors and majors was like 10, 11, 12 or whatever. So we get up there and they have their little draft or whatever. <laughs> and I'm like the number one pick in the, the majors, the Cypress Park Little League <laughs> majors draft. And I'm like, what the heck am I dad? I think he had known that, you know, I could play, but it's hard because I didn't, you know, I'm nine. I don't know like, where my <laughs> talent level translates. So we wind up uh, playing for the, this team, the Rockies. And it was like, my dad's like, I am not coaching. Like, I can't do it and get to the first practice and the coach is reading a manual like how to coach <laughs> for dummies <laughs> and my dad's like oh jeez yeah yeah he's, he's reading, reading he's reading practice. drills out what of to book. do at yeah. your first practice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like we're on like a knee like playing catch and my dad's like so we wound up losing the first game my nine-year-old you're like 24 nothing <laughs> i mean it was bad it was like the bad news bears so my dad winds up taking over the team and uh, he basically ran this team like it was a Division One college <laughs> program. Like, and we're having practices that, like, aren't on the practice schedule. <laughs> like, we're, we're there before games, like, running through, like, bunting lines. <laughs> and, like, it was ridiculous. But that's kind of where I realized, like, it's, it's, it's going to take more. Like, you can't just show up. And so that kind of carried over my 10-year-old year. 11 year old year and then we moved from Canada back for my 12 year old year which I played in San Carlos Little League and I remember we were trying to figure out whether we were going to move to San Carlos or to Palo Alto so I had to try out for both Little Leagues so we were still living in Canada but we had to fly down try out Jeez. for San Carlos and then try out for Palo Alto and then fly back so we wind up flying down, and the San Carlos was actually at this middle school because it had been raining, so it was like pavement. And I'm like, Dad, what is this? Like, I'm trying out at a middle school on their pavement, <laughs> and we're hitting those yellow uh, dimpled yeah. mm -hmm. machine balls. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I remember, they, like, you know, and they had put it in, and it was like, <laughs> and like, <laughs> and like it, well, there was no heat. And so I remember I, like, stepped up, you know, you get like five swings, and so like every kid's up there, like, like it's, I mean, <laughs> embarrassing. Like, <laughs> just sitting out there, I'm like, what is this? Because it was tryouts for majors, like a 12 year old. So it was like guys who hadn't made it for a couple years. So they were probably there because their parents were making them. And so I had first swing, I get up there, like take the first one, just see it. And then the second one, I, I, <laughs> I just turned and burned and let that thing ride and I hit it like over the building like foul and everyone's like who is this kid like it was like you know, it was like a movie where it's like yeah. who is this who is like this Canadian this, yeah. kid? well it's like this the bad like, news bears when the dude with the yeah, long hair yeah, comes Kelly, in and just Kelly Lee riding yep. in on a yeah. motorcycle yeah yeah 12 year old on a <laughs> cigarette in the mouth yeah yeah and then so then the trial ends and one of the coaches comes up he's like hey um I know you guys don't even live here yet, but we're going to C Cooperstown uh, this summer. We'd love you to come play for us. This guy seen me take like five swings, and he's like, so um, he's actually one of my closest family friends now. Um, 
you actually met him at the wedding, Ralph Bosch. I don't know if you, I mean, he was there, but uh, he, so we wound up moving to San Carlos and went to that Cooperstown thing. It, a lot of 12 year olds do it now, but um, so I got to San Carlos and I wound up getting put on the, the Reds and it was like the same, kind of like similar, like you show up and then it's like, who is this kid? Let's draft him number one. Like, because <laughs> usually the people coming through the major league or the the little league majors draft, like, you probably don't want them. <laughs> uh, and so I wound up playing my 12 year old year in San Carlos. And then, kind of interesting how when that season ended, uh, you either go like play the local pony or Joe DiMaggio or. Uh, Legion ball um, but my dad of course was like now we're gonna go play with the older kids like we're gonna go uh, play and travel ball like go play different parts of the country so you can one travel and then two learn how to play on the road and I'm like I'm 13 like <laughs> I don't need to do this but I wanted to so we went up joining NorCal baseball which obviously is much bigger now but back then they had one team, so 13U. Um, and so we wound up, you know, I got super lucky because I got around some of like, the best coaches, like guys who were like in college who were like coaching, um, you know, summer ball just in their off time or whatever it was. Play with some really good players who are now in the big leagues, you know, and I'm playing with them at 13. So. Met the best man at your wedding, too. Yep, yep, best man at my wedding. You know, some of my best friends still. Um, actually, the coach I played for when I was 13 was the one who recruited me at Washington. Um, I, I only got to play for him for one year. But, uh, yeah, so then that was kind of like when I realized, like, oh, this is serious. Like, these dudes are the same dude I was when I was 10, 9 and 10, you know, like in the snow. Like, these are the same guys. Uh, so then that's kind of when I realized like it's it's there's a bigger picture mm -hmm. it's not it's not just me who wants it like mm -hmm. now I see who wants it yeah and then you see how bad you really want it so you know we're traveling to Tennessee we're traveling to Georgia we're traveling to Florida you know we're playing all these teams you know like the teams back then was like uh, Houston Banditos the Houston Heat like these were teams that were like talked about um you know like there were some teams in Washington. So this is like the first time I'm saying like, wow, like there's not just baseball in California. Like mm -hmm. There's baseball everywhere. Um, and so that's kind of when I realized, like, okay, I got to choose. Like, do I want this? Because if I do, I got to go all in, like as a 13 year old. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean like you got to play, that I had to play every weekend. You know, I still played other sports, but it was like, I knew in the back of my mind as a 13 year old, like I'm in. Like when I'm when I'm going, I'm going, mm. and uh, that kind of led to, you know, me up to my high school years. Um, so for like two years, it was that travel ball, um, full time. But then you know, obviously, like when Pop Warner was happening, that was in on that. But you know, I knew I wanted to be, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Mm -hmm. Do you think? So, like, you hear, like, I was listening to, a, you know, a, a podcast with Kobe the other day, and it was right about the same time. It was, like, when I was 13 years old, like, I just mentally knew that's the level I wanted to get to, and, like, you know, it, it made me prepare harder, and, like, I was thinking about, you know, at 13, what, you know, where I was going to be when I was 17, 18, and, like, what I needed to work on now and right. through the next, like, three years, but it's, like, when I was... 13 years old I was like thinking about rollerblading right. in the street with my friends and like climbing right. a tree right like right. there's no thought of yeah. you know like what am I gonna do like even next year or like the next week right. well and that's the crazy part about it is like coming from all of us like we we played baseball and like that was soup something we were super passionate about and there was always that thought like maybe I want to make it to the bigs like mm -hmm. but it wasn't it was like it's not something we knew we were like right. it wasn't going. Tangible, right? Yeah, it, wasn't it was like, all right, I I love playing baseball and like that's really cool. Like, right. but it wasn't like this. I'm going to do this. Yeah. So like, what do you think? Yeah. What? How did that go? Like, how? Well, how I you, mean, what's the difference? It's funny you say that because 
you know, like obviously now with, you know, TV, social media, you know, you see it's like, you know, oh, he just got called to the big leagues and he's got like, you know, crazy stats his first 10 games or whatever. So it didn't like just happen. Mm-hmm. Like it started at 13. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you see, he's, oh, he's undersized, you know, but he's balling. It's like, yeah, but he's been manifesting this since he was 13. Mm-hmm. Like you didn't, like, sorry, social media, like, sorry, ESPN, like, you didn't see that. Like, yeah. you weren't there. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think there's, like, when you see, like, the best of the best, and I think this goes for any sport, it manifested in their minds and their actions, like, so much earlier mm-hmm. than anybody else saw. And I think that's why there's, like, this level of confidence with, like, the best of the best. Where it's like, I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you see today. Like, it started a long time ago, and it's going to keep going whether you believe or not. Mm -hmm. And, like, I think it's, like, that level of, like, mental fortitude where they're so comfortable in themselves and, like, their process that, like, it doesn't matter what you say or what you believe about them. Like, their faith is at, like, a different level. Yeah. I heard a a great story. Um, So it's about Picasso, right? Like, one of the most famous artists of all time. And so he was commissioned to do a portrait and like you know Picasso's style like it's pretty simplistic mm-hmm. and so he was commissioned charged the woman five thousand dollars to do a portrait of her and so she sits down and he starts the portrait and in five minutes he's done and like turns it around and shows it to her and she was like appalled she was like I just paid you five thousand dollars for five minutes of work and he was like no ma'am I've been working on this for a lifetime you know like he's been building his skills for an entire lifetime and he was so confident in his ability like that is worth five thousand dollars because it's not just what you see right here Mm -hmm. it's not just my performance it's my preparation Mm -hmm. for sure and that's like you know like when I like talk to younger baseball players or whatever um whatever sport they're in you know it's like you gotta be you gotta be okay with getting criticized you know and uh you know obviously social media like you you could go on right now and you know, today you could tweet, you know, Braden Bishop can't hit, you know? And it's like, is that going to ruin my, am I going to let that like ruin my day? Or is that going to derail like the work I got to do? Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, like you said, like you got to be confident in like all the work that you do that like that's going to speak for you. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you tweet that I suck at hitting and I go back at you, like that's just, I mean, it's pretty much just like an empty conversation Mm -hmm. because if I'm doing the work, I should have confidence that like, no matter what you believe, like, I know I'm going to be there. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, it, it's, it sucks to see, you know, how many, it's just, it's just a lot easier to be critical now Mm -hmm. because you have Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and that's where everything goes now and it's like people's identities are now tied to it yeah and I would I would I could not imagine someone walking up to you on the street and be like hey Braden Bishop sucks at hitting yeah right like it's much easier to be behind a keyboard yeah and and doing that and Um, if somebody told me I sucked on the street I would be like thanks and then I'd walk (laughs) away like you know like I'm not gonna get into it like what are they yeah. Were they with me? Like, but and this is something that you and I have like had a few conversations about this off season is um, you working on your mental preparation. I feel like one change like, that you've been trying to make is separating playing to others' expectations and playing to your standards. Big. And so, for like you know a young athlete, like how do they start to separate that? How do they start to separate playing to the expectations of the people around them versus having high standards right. and playing to those? Right. The uh, you know, I wish I would have realized it younger, but I think as much time that's spent in a cage should be spent on your mentality. And I don't think there's an age, like, I'm 13, I shouldn't have to, I should just be in the cage, you know, or I should just be on the field, I just gotta build my physical skills. Mm-hmm. Nah, like that, the interview we were talking about with Kobe Bryant, like you hear him say, like, I'm a beast, like, in my mind, I'm a beast, and that started when I was 13. And whether that was self-talk or actual, like, put-in-play mental uh, activities, whatever, um, it's, it can start whenever. Like, it can start today. So for me, I realized after I made it to the big leagues, there's 
it is way deeper. I can't just show up. And, you know, some guys can. And if they do, that's amazing. Um, but for me, it's like i got to peel back layers here. And so I've been lucky enough to find somebody who's opened my eyes to the whole mental side. And like you said, it was like, like what are, when somebody asks me what are my standards, and I sit there and go, I don't know. Yeah. It's like, well, that's a problem. Mm. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer to standards. But once, you, once I identified them, okay, why? Like, what are they? Where do you see them? Where do they apply to your life? Um, and that's when I like, realized, like, oh, my God. Like, I've been playing to others' expectations my whole life. And then mixing in a stand, like my standards every once in a while. And then, you know, they asked me, like, what's your personal mission statement? And I was like, I don't have one. Mm. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to have a personal mission statement, but for me, it opened my eyes. Like, there's, it's deeper. Like, I got to peel back these layers and, like, get inside my mind. Can you, can you give an example of, like, just to give people kind of, an example of what like one of your standards would be or give a an example of like a Maybe time a difference yeah, yeah or like there's one situation where you mm -hmm. could be playing to expectations or right. standards and right. what the difference would be so let's go back to high school so i'm a freshman in Perfect high school transition. yeah <laughs> right back up. so i'm a freshman in high school and actually let's use not my example let's just say you have a freshman or sophomore in high school and they're trying to make their varsity team. And every action and reaction they have is based on what the coach is doing and where he's at. Because player thinks coach makes the decision to put him on varsity or not. And that's all he cares about. So every thing that kid does is based on what is coach thinking so now he's playing to an expectation now if his standard was I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna handle my business or his standard was you know I wanna take I wanna have extreme intention with every ground ball I take so now that's his standard so now no matter what the coach thinks He's playing to his standard of no matter what balls hit on the ground, I'm having an extreme intention in, mm -hmm. in every move I make. So now over the course of you know a five-day period of trying out, instead of his focus being on what that coach is thinking and, oh, my God, did he not like you know the way I ran to first base? It's like, no, he was playing to his standard of that in extreme intention. Well, what do you think coach is thinking? Oh, my gosh, this guy, his focus on ground balls is unreal. Mm -hmm. Like, so much better than every guy I have on varsity. And then guess what? When decisions are made, that's what's talked about. Not, didn't he seem a little tentative to you? Because, you know, he, he felt like he was looking over his shoulder at us the whole time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's the, that's the difference. Like, and that shows up in performance. Yeah. Well, that's huge because, like, um, I forget which book I read this from, but you know, practice is just pra practice is just practice if you're not like intent right. intentional about what you're actually right. practicing. Like, right. mm -hmm. you can sit here and I don't even know do anything, but if you're not completely focused on what you're trying to accomplish, right. then you're really not you're not perfecting anything. Right. Yeah. You're just kind of going through the motions. Right. And it's it's interesting to see. Um, you know, because we work with athletes from seventh, eighth grade all the way up through, you know, you at the playing at the highest level. And it's interesting to see the same traits that we see in you in the younger kids. And it's like, that's what coaches see. Yeah. It's, it's not that we just see talent, because there's a ton of kids that walk in here with talent yeah. that don't stand out because of their characteristics, right. right? They don't stand out because everything is intentional. Right. But it's so different to look in a kid's eye and see that his intention, mm -hmm. like the so same intention I see when you're just like staring me dead in the eye yeah. is the same intention I see with the kid who's a standout freshman who not only has the talent, but he's like, you know, when he asks you a question, he's like staring right. in your soul. Like, how can right. I get to the yeah. next level? Right. What, what can I do to be better than the guy next to me? Right. And that's like, we've had the conversation a couple times where it's like, what is it that yeah. separates those kids? Like what? 
And I think for you, it's like, it's intent. Like yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's everything you do. Right. And people always are like, dude, why are you getting pissed off? Like, that was a sick swing. And I'm like, yeah, but my intent wasn't there. Like, I can't tell you how many times I'm, I've been in a cage, not, not with the team, you know, whether it's in the off season or what. And I'll be hitting with other guys or younger guys, and I'll, like, I'll hit a really good one. And they'll be like, why are you getting pissed off? Like, that was a great swing, great result. It has nothing to do with that. Like, it is 100%. My intent was not there on that swing, and that's why I'm pissed off. Mm. Like, I can't afford to just leave that. And I, that's, like, a perfect example of expectations versus standards. Yes, exactly like, right. the expectation is like, ah, seem pretty good off the bat. Right. And you, like, look around, everybody's yep. stoked about it. And that's where, like, that's the separators. One person could be like, hey, everybody thought that was good enough. Yeah, exactly. And to you, your standards, it doesn't mean No, that. because at the, at the end of the day, and obviously you're in high school and college, eh, college, you're like right on the board, but like, this is my life. Like my livelihood depends on my intent. And if it's not there, like I can't just roll up, show up, do my work and leave. Like when I'm doing my work, it needs to be so intentful. And it goes back to if I'm doing a, a med ball toss, and my intent wasn't there. Like, in my mind, I am so pissed off at myself. And, like, even it goes to my eating. Like, yeah. And I'm a little psycho on the eating <laughs> side. But, like, if, like, literally, if I miss a meal by 30 minutes, I'm so mad at myself because my intent was there. If my intent was there, I would eat. I would find time. And I think it goes to, like, anything with me is I find myself getting, like, pissed off at myself because... I let myself go a little bit mm -hmm. where it's like my intent has to be there. And obviously it's much different because Major League Baseball is such a performance-based industry and you could lose your job tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like it's just a reality. So for me, I feel like if I'm not doing everything I possibly can to put myself in a position to have sustained success, then I'm doing myself a disservice. I'm doing my family a disservice. I'm doing you guys a disservice. So, you know, I think it really does come down to intent and that could go for somebody working a nine to five, you know, the guy collecting garbage. You know, you hear those stories all the time where it's like, dude, that garbage man was unbelievable. I'm like, mm -hmm. he got in, got out. He was so intentional about his work. I saw him every morning, asked me, or every time he came and got the trash, how, he asked me, how are you? Like, that's intent that, like, can be at any level. Well, like, we were talking about this the other day, actually, where we were talking, I don't know if Aaron asked you, like, if you had any goals for this next yeah. year. And you were just like, I don't understand goals. Yeah. And Ser I, no, and, serious. And it, that really sparked me, and I'm like, wow, like, that's crazy because yeah, a person performing at the highest level well and it it was we kind of talked about it for a little bit and it was almost that everything you do is striving to get to a goal but you don't even like yeah. you're so accustomed to that yeah. you don't even have to set goals it's yeah. like something you don't understand goals because everything you do yeah. is Right. It's just ha habitual. Right. Yeah. Like, you don't have to set this goal to attain it. It's almost like it's embedded in you because you've thought about it for so yeah. long yeah. that you don't even have to, like, set this goal you have to yeah. get to. It's already. Right. Well, I think, I think this would be a good, because this goes right along with your personal mission statement, right? Where it's, you know, obviously, like you said, not everybody needs to have, well, it's probably a good idea, at least to yeah. think about it. Yeah. But, like, you know, tell us a little bit about your personal mission statement and how that aligns with um, just how you live your life. Right. Yeah, so when I was trying to develop my, my mission statement, like, figure out, like, okay, what do I really believe? You know, what is, like, the ultimate standard I want to set? And, you know, it comes back to the intent and to be intentional. And... Whether that what when I when I looked at it, I was like writing down, writing down. You know, I'd have these like fat paragraphs, and I'd be like, nah, it's, it's lacking. It's lacking. You know, I'd write a short one. Nah, it's missing. It doesn't touch everything. And then <laughs> one night, I'm like getting ready to go to bed, and I was like, oh my god, I got it. I got my my book, and I write it down, and a couple sentences, and I read it, and I'm like, that's it. 
it touches every area of my life. And um, it, it was like, okay, this allows me room to grow. It, I don't have to be perfect. And no matter what I'm doing or where I'm doing it, I can always come back to it. And it's centered around intention and being intentional. I'm a husband. Okay, am I being intentional in my relationship? Okay, I'm a student. Am I being intentional in my work, in my relationship with my teacher? You know, I'm a, I'm a son. Am I being an intentional son? Like, am I caring? You know, am I, is every detail important, no matter how small? And I will tell you, since I wrote it down, my whole life has, at least from my perspective, changed. Because now I'm so aware of everything. Mm -hmm. I'm filling up water in in my house. Can I not spill a drop? Like, it's that deep for me. Yeah. Because if I don't, like, then it just won't manifest and, like, carry over into my work and into hitting and into playing. And baseball games are three hours. And I want to be so mentally tired at the end of the game. Like, physically, whatever, you know you're going to be tired. Like, it's an activity. You're being active, but I want to be so mentally tired at the end of the game. Like, that's where I draw my line of, like, you had a good night or not. It has nothing to do with results, you know. Yeah. So let's say you're sitting down with a sophomore in high school, an athlete, or even a 30-year-old corporate dude, and he's like, you know, I want to raise my standards. I want to raise my expectations. And it's just you and him sitting down together over coffee. Um, he has his notebook. What are kind of like the maybe first one to three things you're going to have him think about? The first couple questions you're going to ask him. Um, the first couple things you're going to have him write down. Like what's, what's the starting point that maybe your mental coach, you know, helped you figure out um, that is going to get the ball rolling to, to start raising those standards and expectations? I think, see, it's really easy to say it to somebody. And I think the best, I've had a ton of great minds, like give me great information. And I sat down, looked at information, and then I went, okay, now what? Once I realized the how to, and like how to apply it, then it changed. So like for me, it was like, you can read like a self-help book and you get all fired up because you read the cover and you read the little synopsis and you're like, let's go. Like, I need it. I need that. That's exactly what I need in my life. And then you read the book and you finish and you go, oh my God, I got so much great information. But like, how do I apply a Navy SEALs mindset to my accounting job or to my 13U baseball team? Like, how do you apply that? And that's when... I think it's really important to, first of all, be being accountable to your actions. But like, what does accountable mean? The best I've ever heard it put was, um, there's a guy who, his name's Brian Kite, and I was lucky enough to hear him speak. And um, so like his big thing is, are you blaming people? Are you complaining? And I'm like, when I heard that, I was like, yes, I do blame people. And yes, I do complain. And then I realized, oh my God, like I can't get to that next level. Like I can't get to that next layer if I'm blaming people and complaining because now I'm taking, I'm not being accountable to like any action because anything that happens, I want to blame and then I want to complain about it or I want to complain about my situation. And you know, those two those two principles of blaming and complaining, like take those out or at least be aware that they're happening mm -hmm. to try and at least not do it as much. And now I can actually like make some growth because everything that happens that, that it has a result, you know, whether it's you're in accounting, whether you're a teacher or a 13 year baseball player or a high school baseball player, like every result that happens, like you can now be accountable and be like, you know what? I did, I did blow that, you know, I, I didn't put my full effort or full intent into that, um, 
into that project or into that teammate. Um, and then you can make actual growth because you're like, okay, that's where I got to grow now. I, I got to be aware that I need to put more intent into my teammate or the next project I get, I have to be more intentful. I have to be more purposeful. It doesn't mean from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, it has to be on that. Mm -hmm, but yeah. when you're doing it, like, where is the intent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, like, so one book that I think we might have all read, Extreme Ownership, I know Nolan's read it. Um, but one thing that it touches on and talks about in great detail that you touched on is the first step of that process is being, being, becoming aware mm -hmm. of how quickly it is human nature to pass the blame. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I try to teach our kids about this, but if you don't check that and realize that at first, your whole life, you are just blaming others for everything that happens to you. And it's not that it's, it's not bad or your fault that is human nature mm -hmm. when things don't go your way yep. next time something doesn't go your yeah. way try to be aware of how quickly your brain tries to switch it onto yeah. someone else Seriously. like your brain does not want to take accountability Seriously. but the first uh, the first step is just realizing that and like trying immediately when something doesn't go your way be like okay how how did my actions affect this Seriously. right and then imagine what that'll do to your relationships because if you're in a relationship and the second something bad happens, you start passing blame, guess what that person's human nature is to pass blame right back, right. right? And so then it becomes this endless cycle of like, we don't have any respect for each other because they're not taking ownership of their shit and then I don't take ownership of mine. Yep. But then if you switch it and you're like, hey, like I understand that what I did, my actions had this effect, what can we do to kind of mend that? And then it becomes a relationship of respect and the other person, now that you've taken ownership, guess what they're going to do? They're going to take ownership of their part. And so instead of it just being, you know, everybody's passing blame in this, this group or this relationship, now everyone takes ownership for their actions and you can actually make some change now. Oh, big time. And I think w the more I get into, like the older I get, the more great athletes that I see, even just great human beings, I'm like, what do they have? In, like, what is the thing that I see? You know, like you could get as scientific as you want, but like what do I see in my eyes that makes them all the same? Their awareness is at a different level and you don't have to be good to be aware. And that's the thing I always come back to, like, am I being aware? And I guess it goes along with intention as well. I'm driving down the street, I have to be aware. The best drivers are aware, like the best accountants, the best teachers, the best coaches, they're all aware. Like they're aware of their athletes, they're aware of their students, they're aware of their work, they're aware of what's going on around them. You know, like you said, like how can I take, like why are they so great? Because they take accountability, because they're aware of their actions and how it affects the people around them and not just them. And it's so freaking easy when something happens to blame it mm -hmm. and to compl this is not a good situation I want to complain and like I think back on my career and like there's years where I'm like God, I wish I could go back like all I did was complain mm -hmm. like how toxic is that so yeah. like we how, see it all the time how toxic was I to that team yeah there's so Brene Brown has a great yeah. quote and it's like one of my life goals is to contribute more than I criticize yeah. And it's like, it, so evaluate true. your actions and Seriously. see if you're contributing or criticizing. Seriously. So going back to something you said just a minute ago, and it kind of goes with the blame thing and criticizing, not necessarily other people, but yourself. Um, you kind of talked about like, if you get off track with your meals or, you know, something doesn't really go your way, you, you kind of get mad at yourself and you, you blame yourself for that. So how do you like reset and not let that snowball keep going of that self-blame because obviously that can get kind of rough quick yeah. and can turn you know 10 minutes into a bad day and then into a bad week and you know that can be toxic to other people around you as well so how do you reset you know let's say you make a mistake or you know meal goes off track um, and not let that snowball keep rolling down the hill I think the biggest thing is like the how the perspective you have on it like it doesn't have to keep rolling downhill like it's start it can stop now and then you can start again and like I think 
especially with eating and the more I dive because I mean I've dove into so many rabbit holes just with Alzheimer's and dementia and how food affects that and then my own eating and how it affects performance and it's like okay I have nothing to eat right now like would I rather not eat or would I rather settle a little bit you know like wherever I'm at like if this is all I have to eat I know I have to eat I have to put something in my body. So then I put it in my body and I'm pissed off at myself. I'm like, gosh darn it. Why poison. would you do that? Yeah, poison. Why would you do that? And, and for me, it's like the difference of like wild caught and farm raised salmon. You know, like it's not <laughs> like in and out or nothing. Right. So it's like I eat it and then I'm pissed off because I know like I, I can be better than that. But instead of me being like, like wallowing in that, I'm like, okay, my next meal, you know, or like I said, my next project um, is is going to be better, and it like it starts then. And so like, that's a perspective I have is like, no matter what it is, what zero oh for four, okay, I'm pissed off. But mm-hmm. I wake up the next day, I'm like, it starts today, and like that's like the difference where like before. And I think baseball is perfect because how many times do you see? I've had it happen to me more than once, mm-hmm. like twenty. Okay, <laughs> but like too many times, but. The, it's like, I, I go 0 for 4, and then I care to the next day, I don't want to go 0 for 4, and what do I do? I go 0 for 4, and then I'm like, oh my God, I'm 0 for 8, I don't want to go 0 for 12, and then before I know it, I'm 0 for 20, you know, or I go 41, ga- I had a stretch where I went 41 games, and I hit 154, and I was like, and I look back now, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, how did I go, that is so hard to do. That is so hard to do. 41 games, like, and I look back and I was like, okay, what was I doing? And it was like, oh my God, I'm one for my last 18. Oh my gosh, I'm two for my last 42. And where it could have ended by the way I was speaking to myself, mm-hmm. that, that second game. Yeah. You know, like, I just hit a, a laser beam and the center fielder made a great catch. No, I'm good. I'm a beast. Like it's, and obviously you're not saying this out loud, but like this is the way you gotta s- speak to yourself. Yeah, yeah. And how many times do you come to that crossroads of like, let me wallow, let me feel sorry for myself, like mm-hmm. let me go in the dugout and say, guys, I freaking suck, you know, and take everybody's attention off what they're doing and put it on you mm-hmm. instead of just saying, I'm good, I'm good, I can do this, yeah. I'm a beast. Like, n- yeah. he better come see me because I'm gonna be ready. Like, that's the difference. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. you know, so like well, going back to eating, like it starts now, right? When you want it to start, it'll start. Yeah, and it's, it's going back to those standards where it's like your standards are standards because you have a very strong belief that you can exactly. match those standards, exactly. right? So it's not like standards aren't just there to criticize yourself. Yeah. Standards are there to, yes. hey, this is what Ex- we can do. Exactly. We absolutely believe exactly. that we can do that. Yeah, yeah. crazy yeah. belief. And also just to touch on that point, it's, you know, whatever we feed grows, right? So mm-hmm. if we're feeding negative thoughts on a daily yes. basis, 100%. it's just going to continue oh. to grow and it's, you know, it's going to go downhill. Oh my gosh. Um, but if, you know, you can reset and, and I think it's just making it a habit. Obviously making thought habits is difficult at first, especially if you're young or if you never worked on it before. Mm-hmm. But I'm, you know, even if it's an affirmation or some some words that you need to write down that it's you say to yourself daily, because you need to continually feed that positive thought. Because if not, there, you know, obviously there's a lot of negative with social media and, you know, looking at different things, and there's probably some negative people around you. So that stuff is gonna be inevitable. Like it's, you know, weeds in a garden are gonna be inevitable. But if you want positive things, if you want flowers in the garden, that's stuff that you have to feed on a daily basis yes, yes. and the, the some of the best I've played with and one of them I'm not gonna say his name but I mean he's on like a level that I've never seen in my whole life like he sacrificed things in his life that you don't have to sacrifice but he does because he wants to be so great on every level and I mean, he's one of the most intense guys I know. And when he wakes up in the morning, he looks himself in the mirror and he literally says, I'm a beast, I'm a beast, I'm the best. I'm the best in the league. I'm, like says stuff to him that like, if you heard it, you'd be like, yeah. 
like my guy like we have Mike Trout in the league yeah. like yeah. <laughs> you know like but he he says it to himself because he knows that's going to manifest his actions mm-hmm. and you know he's even said to me like like is it the truth like if you heard it you'd probably say no but like I'm going to keep saying it until I make it happen and it's like okay if you don't make it happen on Mike Trout's level but you make it happen on the level just below his like <laughs> You're getting paid a lot of money. Yeah, it's, so. it's crazy that you say that because I have a, one of my best friends in the world. And, at, I mean, for his age, absolutely one of the most successful people I know. And he's just always been on a whole nother yeah. level mentally. But he does the same thing, but he does it on his car drive to work. Yeah. He's got like a 45-minute 45, 45 drive to work. And he's told me he does it literally the entire time <laughs> he's crazy. driving to work, no which way. is nuts. Talk about but, intention. But it's crazy. <laughs> so he... Um, he'll just like be talking to himself, like firing himself up. And he just does it until he feels like he just means it. But he says he's been sitting in traffic before and he's like pounding on his steering wheel, like (laughs) no music on nothing, just screaming to himself. And he's like, I don't care. Like, I don't care if the person next to me looks over and does it. And like this kid at 24 was, works for an investment company worldwide. He was a number one salesman, like, in any age group, in any bracket. like, And it's just, if you look across the board, people successful, it does not matter what your job is, doesn't matter what your vocation is. Like, You look and you see the same traits over all success. And that's the stuff that doesn't take talent. Yeah, right? Those are the things that you can do on a daily basis regardless of your talent level that obviously if you want to be LeBron James, like you're not going to talk yourself into being LeBron right, James. Like right. you have to have a certain amount of talent. Right. But at whatever stage you are, let's say you're a strength coach or you are an accountant or you're the garbage man, right? All those things like you can be the absolute best at and it's the things that you cultivate on a daily yes. basis that help you. You know there. where you see that all the time is, you know, everybody's had it. You have a, you have a server at a restaurant or at any place, a service-based industry. And it's like they hate their job. And it's like, okay, I wanna like take them and be like, hey, you have this job, okay? You, you are literally doing this job. Why don't you make the most of it? Like, why don't you try and maximize where you're at? Like, because I don't wanna be here. Okay, well then go get a different job. Like nobody's telling you you gotta be there. Yeah. And like, I'll never understand that. I'm like, you are in a service-based industry. What you do, like you're, think about how many people a server affects Mm -hmm. a day. Like how many times have you left a place and you're like, that person sucked. Yeah. (laughs) Like they brought terrible vibes to my table. Mm -hmm. It was like everything I was, I was asking was a hindrance to them. And it's like, how many people are going to leave there and they'll think that way about, about that restaurant? Like, the restaurant has an owner and other employees. Mm-hmm. Now they, the person goes on Yelp and writes a bad review. Now it affects the whole entire restaurant because mm-hmm. of one person. And, like, I just ne- I'll never understand that. Like you have a choice. Well, and also, too, it's like respect the level that you're at. And if you take care of the stuff that you have now, that's how you're going to graduate to get better yes. stuff. It's like yes. if you have a 1998 Honda Civic and you want a Lexus, right, but your 1998 Honda Civic hasn't been washed in a year and a half, and you have McDonald's wrappers all over the floor, it's like... Poison. <laughs> it's like, why do you even deserve to have something better? Yeah. Right? Treat your 1998 Honda Civic like it's a Lexus yeah. while you're working on yourself and developing yourself on a daily basis, and then you're actually going to like deserve and treat the stuff that you get when you graduate to the next level. You're going to treat that stuff even better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, we live in a society of instant gratification. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the there's microwave generation. Yeah, yeah, so many people want the I want it now. I want it now. Like you read a book and it's like, mm-hmm. okay, when's it happening? And it's I like, okay, hey, but that yeah. <laughs> exactly. But that book literally just was written like from the start of the book to the end. One, the story took a long time to play out. And two, the book didn't just write itself in one day. Mm-hmm. Like, you got you to gotta put in your time. Like, and that's, the once you're okay with that, like, you realize, like, I can hit speed bumps. I can have hiccups. But, like, I know I'm going to get somewhere else. Like, I know I want to get somewhere else. 
it might not happen today or mm-hmm. tomorrow or next year. That's hard. Like for some people, that's so hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, and going back to that, like self-talk, it doesn't just happen overnight. No. Like for the person who doesn't do that yet and like self-talk, it's going to feel weird because yeah. your yes. whole entire so life, your mind has probably been talking negative about yourself. Like yeah. if you're not used to that, it's going to feel weird yes. saying you're a beast, you yeah. know, like yeah. you're going to kill it today. Yeah. It's going to feel weird. Yeah. But the more practice you yeah. put in, the more natural yeah. it's going to feel and the more benefit you're going to get out of it. But it's not going to just happen overnight where you're looking in the mirror and you're like, oh yeah, yeah. I am a beast. Yeah. But know? even on the level of, I can remember being in center field at the University of Washington and literally like whether I just struck out and I'm walking from, like I struck out, I'm walking around the plate to center field in between innings and I'm saying to myself, you freaking suck. What are you doing? Why are you here? Like, why are you even playing? Like, quit. Like, that's what I'm literally saying to myself. Like, so why couldn't I say to myself, you're good. Mm -hmm. You got three more. That's AB one of 275 you're gonna have this year. You're good. He's not better than you. Like, why couldn't I say that mm-hmm. to myself, you know? It's on, like, that level. Yeah. But, like, once you get in the mirror, like, and you're looking at yourself, <laughs> especially when you're ugly like me, like. <laughs> but also, too, that boils down to awareness, like we talked yes, about earlier. Yeah, 100%. So, especially, like, if you're a young high school player, just now that you've listened to something like this, like, you can, now you can, like, be aware of when it starts happening. Yeah. And I think that's how it, it, you get it to a point where it doesn't start snowballing into one for 48. Yeah. yeah. Right? Just remember, like, next time you're in the field or you're in the classroom and you get a bad grade on your test, like, when those negative thoughts start to happen, like, be aware of that and snap out of it and have your, you know, your positive self-talk or your couple words that you say to yourself so that it doesn't continue to snowball. Yeah. yeah. And watch for me, it's like, I started to notice it on the tiniest things. It's like, I would leave, I would leave something in my room back. Like, oh man, that was stupid. Yeah. And it's like, now I'm, I look at myself and I'm like, what, where did that even come from? Yeah. Like, why am I calling myself stupid yeah, for making exactly. a mistake? Right. You know? And I think it's crazy how quickly it must be like human nature, how quickly we yeah. do that. But the second you start realizing it, and like you get those thoughts come into your mind, you're like, oh, that doesn't serve me. Yeah. I'm not thinking that yeah. anymore. Yeah. You know? But I think that this is a good transition because I kind of want to get back. I want you to be able to tell your whole story, right? Yeah. So now let's transition kind of into UW mm-hmm. and like your experience. And maybe you want to touch on, you know, what kind of brought you to UW. I know you talked about your little league coach, but what was that transition like going from high school Braden to college Braden? And, how did that experience kind of bring you into the, the person you are today? I don't know how I even, like, when UW started recruiting me, I was actually on, I was at a camp at UCLA, and, like, my mom went to UCLA. Like, the coach at the time, who is now the head coach at Fullerton, um, he was the hitting coach at UCLA. He was like, he's going to come here. Like, his mom went here. Mm-hmm. And, like, I wanted to go to L.A. Like, you know, UCLA at the time was – one of the best in the Pac-12, and uh, then UW calls, and I'm like, "Where is UW? I'm like, "What conference are you guys in?" <laughs> and they're like, "What does the dub stand for?" Yeah, we're, we're in the Pac-12, and I'm like, "What?" And then, uh, so I, I talk to their coach every Monday, uh, my sophomore year of high school, and I mean, literally the greatest human being I've ever met in my life to this day. And he's now the head coach at St. Mary's. And I go back to our conversations, and I was like, I want to go to UW. And I just, I got remember, every Monday I was like, I want to go to UW. And I went up there and visited. Pouring rain. And then I see their stadium. And it, it literally looks like if you take those wood boxes and put three of them and then had three fans sit on them, that's what their stadium looked like. It was brutal. <laughs> But meeting with the coach and then the head coach, Coach Megs, they they had this vision where it was like, we're going to build a stadium. Like, we want you to come. We want you to be a part of the first team to change the culture here to make it back to the playoffs. And, like, just something about it, I was like, I want, like, I want this. Like, I want, I don't want to go somewhere and just be another team. I want to go somewhere and be the team. And so my freshman year, 
I didn't play it. I actually, so my senior high school, you know, like, it's like, oh, he's going to get drafted and he's committed and he's going to pack 12. And, um, you know, you, there's like, you're the guy. And how many guys, how many times have you heard, like, you're the guy in your high school program and then you go to your college and then you're just another guy. And I get to college, you know, 0 for 5, 4 strikeouts. 0 for 33 strikeouts. Don't play, fr- don't play Sunday. Don't play the next Friday. Don't play the next Saturday. Don't play the next Sunday. Don't play Tuesday. Get a pinch hit on Friday. Whatever. This is the first time in my life I was like, oh, my God, this game sucks. <laughs> you know, like, this coach, he, he told me I was going to play. And so I, I so vividly remember my dad came to visit. We're playing Cal Poly. You know, tough, tough weekend. Like, just brutal. And I remember coming off the field and – my dad was there, and I was like, I'm leaving. I can't do this. Like, I don't, I don't like where I'm at. You know, the coach isn't being nice to me. And, you know, he was like, all right, like, if you want to, like, you can leave, but where are you going to go? What's it going to look like? Are you going to go to junior college? Like, are you going to transfer back to junior college, go from this luxurious Pac-12 lifestyle to JC? Like, do you love it that much? And... That's when I like step back and I was like, oh my God, like how lucky am I right now? Like how many of those JC guys would want to be in my shoes? Like how many guys are done playing who would want to be in my shoes? And that's when I realized like, okay, I got to make a decision. Like am I all in? Like I said I was when I was 13 or am I just like kind of in, you know, am I just playing because it's just taking me here? And so then my freshman year, I was like, I'm going all in. So I worked more. I tried to focus more. I went into our head coach, and it's really hard to do this, like, at a professional level. But, like, in college, I went to him. I said, I'll never forget. We were, go- we were actually coming to play Stanford. And I was like, I can't sit three days in a row in front of my whole family and friends. Like, I can't do it. So I went in, and I said, hey, coach, like, what do I need to do to get on the field? And I don't know if he was waiting for me to come ask him that. Like, if it was a test. I mean, you never know with college coaches because they're always throwing the tests at you. One for you to grow as a player, one for you to grow as a man. And he goes, you're not doing anything. That's not keeping you on the field. But now I know that you're in. Now I know you want to be in there. Because a lot of times you get to that, that level and you're like, I'm happy to be here. And he was waiting for me to say that. So Friday night, Stanford. I go to the line, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to play Friday. That's fine. I tell my whole family, hey, I'm not playing Friday. Mark Appel's pitching, and Mark Appel's going to be 1-1 that year, throwing 98, whatever. And I'm a scrawny little freshman, and I go up, I'm hitting sixth. And I'm like, what? I'm, oh, my gosh. And I was like, okay, that's what I want. So, anyway, my whole family's there. I wind up playing Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I get three hits Sunday in front of my family. That was, like, the first time I realized, like, what I think and how I communicate is going to make such a difference at this level in college. Because how many times, like, I'm not playing, I hate the coach. Mm-hmm. But, like, he might just be waiting for you to go in there and be like, hey, I want to yeah. play. How do I play? Yeah. What do I need to do? And that's when I realized, like, communication is so important. Yeah. And, and ownership versus blame. Serious, yes, 100%. And, and I had gotten to the point where in that Kyle Pauly game, I wanted to blame. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's when I, like, stepped back and was like, okay, this obviously is not working. Like, I'm not playing. So I can – and that was kind of the first time I realized, like, how to lift people up around me, especially ones who are playing. And, you know, I, I wish I could go back and, like, apologize to some of my college teammates because I feel like I wasn't the best teammate at times. You know, you get caught up in your results and – you're 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, but, like, I, I, f- I still feel guilty about it because I know what I know now about culture and, you know, how to lift people up and, like, push them. And especially my junior year, but I'll get to that. But then my sophomore year, we had the – that was the team. The one that I had thought about when I was like, I don't want to go somewhere where we're going to be another team. I want to be like the team. So my sophomore year, every guy. I mean, we were, we were so deep from 
left field to the last guy on the bench. Like everybody was pulling the same direction. You know, like our our backup our backup guys who are mostly like freshmen, sophomore. Like they they kind of adopted this uh, mentality of like we're the D squad. Like we want we want to we know we're not going to start, but we're going to cheer all game. And then when it comes time in the seventh, eighth, ninth, and we need some D replacements, like they're it and they're ready. And so it got all the way back to that level. So we wound up making that. Uh, we actually finished second in the Pac-12, wound up losing to Oregon State uh, the last weekend of the year um, on Saturday. So they wound up winning the Pac-12. But it had been like the highest finish we've had in like 10 years. We wound up making it to a regional um, at Ole Miss. And we wound up making it to the regional championship. And Ole Miss beat us and went to the World Series. but. That was like the team, like put UW on the map, like they built a new stadium. Uh, so like for me, it felt so good. I was like, I came here, like we accomplished something that's so much bigger than like just me. And then my junior year, you know, draft year, and I let the draft totally consume me, like make me up. Like I had a decent year, but I mean, it consumed me, stressed me out, it made me a you know, a worse teammate than I should have been. You know, I think the draft is a very tough hurdle for a lot of guys to get over. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah, I remember you kind of describing that to me where it was like, I think you were into the last like two weekends or something mm -hmm. and you're sitting right at like a 300. Oh. And I, I, you kind of, I don't want to say you blame it, but you look back and you're like me being conscious of that made me not get it. Yeah, talk about expectations. I mean, yeah. I was, that's the ultimate. Like, as a high school senior, junior, or senior in college, the minute you play to the expectation of the draft, like I can't tell you, I'd have one game where I'd get the average over 300, hey, you're going in the first round. And then it'd dip at 299, and be like, hey, man, you're not going to go in the first round. And like, that's what I was literally playing on, was Every game, it was like this, that. I'm having, you know, you're having scouts calling you saying, hey, man, your swing didn't look very good tonight. Well, hey, I just faced a guy who's going to be a first-round pick. Like, that was, that was a little bit tough, you know? Like, I mean, mentally, that's so oh, tough. Oh, I mean, it was like to the point where I was like literally like hyperventilating on my yeah. couch because I was so stressed out. I mean, at that age, oh, like my to, gosh. to have to think about but that type of stuff. But the yeah. thing that's crazy is like, you know it's going to be your livelihood. So like it is stressful, but the minute you start trying to play and have your actions towards the expectations of that, mm -hmm. like it totally takes away from everything that's important. Your your family, your girlfriend, your fiance, whatever, your your team especially. And like that's why I'm I feel so and I'm in a much better place now where I can like say this, but like I was a bad teammate my junior year. Like I look back and I'm like I wish I could call every single guy on that team and say, I am sorry because I was a bad teammate. I wasn't there for you like I should have been. And, you know, it helped me grow, you know. So when I went to pro ball, and I knew, like, I never want to be that guy again. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it helped me grow. But, like, you know, it sucks. Like, I, I don't wish anybody would feel like that. Yeah. Well, one thing that I've realized, and it's crazy, what made me realize it was learning more about motor learning, mm -hmm. like how the body learns, how to do movements, right? Yeah. And when we're talking about motor learning, the way our body learns how to work is it has to make mistakes so it can create rules so that those mistakes never happen again. Right. And it's like, when you look at you know, your life, you're like, well, yeah, I know I have to make mistakes, but I don't really want to. No, like that is that is nature yeah. like that. That's how the universe works. You make a mistake, you learn from it and it doesn't happen again, yeah. but it's so hard in the moment to be like, Oh, I made a mistake. Yeah. I'm really happy that happened, Seriously. you know, but when you have the awareness to understand like this adversity that I'm going through, whatever it is, is going to allow me to never make that mistake yeah. again and have appreciation for it while you're yeah. going through it. Like, changes your perspective yeah. on well everything. and if you do go through that again how do you handle it like yeah even though you make a mistake and you learn from it it doesn't mean it's not going to happen again yeah make but, sure you learn yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. like what are you going to do when that situation does come up and you do make that mistake yeah. again like how do you handle it well yeah. i was i was actually talking to my dad about this last weekend you know because my brother and i are a little bit different and 
you know, my dad and I were kind of talking about like his situation he's been through, mine I've been through. And I was telling my dad, I told my dad, hey, thank you, because there's been like five or six times I could think of the top of my head where I've been in a position where the same thing has happened and it, it hasn't been good. But because of what I learned from the last time, this time wasn't as bad. And I was able to push through it because of the prior times. And an example is like my freshman year, I got the UW and you know, I'm, my whole life is in California. And now I'm in Seattle in the storm room. And I'm like, I can't do it. Like, this is, this is so bad. Like, you know, my mom and dad are home. My brother's home. All my friends are home. You know, I, my success is at home. And now I'm like failing and the weather sucks. And I barely know anybody on the team. And the seniors treat you like you're, you know, inferior and you're in this big pond. And, and then I go to pro ball and I have the same exact feeling. But it's like, I already had this feeling. I already went through this. Now I know how to handle it. I just got to go to sleep, wake up the next day, one foot in front of the other. You'll figure your way out. Mm-hmm. So yeah. back, backtracking a little bit to your, your uh, studly hockey days. <laughs> so that time that you were sitting in that locker room yep. and you didn't want to go out on the ice, yeah. and that was like your, the last time you were ever in, I gone in the, on the hockey ice. rink. But does, so did that lesson learned play into these yeah, lessons 100%. now and that's like I look I mean I try not to look back on it because I'm in a great spot in terms of like the decision I made mm-hmm. and all the work I've done but I look back and I'm like I wish I would have gone that it's like what would have happened I mean maybe I wouldn't maybe I'd be working in business like Selling who knows insurance. right <laughs> You don't know, like, yeah. maybe it was the best decision, maybe well, it was the if, worst, but... Maybe if you, if you would have went onto the ice or, and you didn't, like, feel that feeling, yeah. maybe at UW, who knows, you could have hung them up, you know? Yeah, sir, no, It's sir. like, yeah. I'm not going out on the ice today, sir. you know? Yeah. And because of that experience, yeah. you're sir. like, no, sir. I'm not hanging them up. Sir. Like, <laughs> I think uh, decision-making, not what decision you make, but actually making the conscious choice to make a decision. You know how many times, like this, I go through this all the time. What are we eating? I don't care. What, what do you want to eat? And then two hours later, you're like, okay, what, like, what are we doing? And then you just settle again. You know, it's like, how many times, it's like, no, we're having Thai. Mm-hmm. You know, like just the fact to like make a decision. Like I just, I just talked to my mental coach about this. Like, I didn't have to make decisions because my mom made decisions. Mm -hmm. But it's like, I have to make decisions. Like for me, for my wife, for my team, you know, like how good does it feel when you have that person that you can always go to that makes the decision? Like, Well, and also too, I think it boils down to setting up habits where the decisions are somewhat made for you already that you like predetermined. And I don't know if it's true, but I heard Mark Zuckerberg wears like the same color shirt every day. So it doesn't take any mental capacity. <laughs> yeah. And also too, well, like uh, something that I've been doing that's been huge for me is every night after I take a shower, I set out my clothes for the next morning. Same. So then when I'm trying, like when I'm in the morning, it's not something where I have to think and I set out what I'm going to eat in the morning. I set out my coffee cup and everything's prepped. Yep. So instead of taking 30 minutes of mental effort to say for all those decisions, like, you know, how long is that going to take? It takes me 10 minutes because yeah. everything's already there right. and I don't have to think about it. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. good. And it's easy for us because we just rock HDA every day. <laughs> 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 you ain't got to really think about anything. Really. Sure. Just I do shoes. Laundry, yeah. Yeah. laundry once a week and I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I got, well, now we have enough HDA gear for like a yeah, month. Yeah. Serious. So shout out. Serious. <laughs> but then, so I think, um, obviously, the, the people that are close to you, close to your family, um, know your story, right? And I know it's something that you become extremely passionate about telling your story and telling your family's story. And, you know, it goes right along with your experience in college. And I know that this experience created the man you are today. And so I want you to kind of be able to tell the story and um, where it has taken you and your family now and what your aspirations are for your mission, yeah. um, everything that has to do with, with your foundation and your yeah. charity. Yeah, so, I mean, for people who don't know, 
my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 52. So that was in 2014. And I was a junior at UW. And I had always known that I wanted to advocate for something. You know, you see all these professional athletes have their own foundation and blah, blah. So like so badly, I wanted to give. And I didn't know that, I always say, I didn't know it'd be so personal. Mm -hmm. And I wish it wasn't, but the reality is it was. So we wound up kind of starting like a, it was more like a campaign at first, you know, to get people's awareness on what Alzheimer's was and that people as young as 52 can get it, uh, what it, you know, can do. But I didn't know like from 2014 to 2009, like what the journey would look like in terms of like what the actual disease does to an individual, what it does to her caregivers, what it does to families, um, and then, you know, how quickly it can be over. And uh, so we, at school, we wound up having our first event. Our strength coach at the time, Dave Rack, uh, kind of put this whole thing together. We're gonna have a, a deadlift like competition uh, where people would just like pay money to come in and deadlift and people would come watch. So we went, I saw how much we could raise. And I was like, oh my God, we could really, like my platform's small, but like it's my platform. Can make like, an yes, like even though it's small. And so I just like went all in. Same, you know, that was kind of my mentality. Like, I'm going all in on this thing. So we wind up having a couple more events. Uh, I got really lucky that our sports information director at UW was, like, so con connected with the Seattle media. Got the story out there. You know, I'd actually write it on my forearm and Sharpie for every game. And then it just, the media started picking up on it, started telling the story, and then it went from local to regional to national. And then I get drafted by the Mariners. So like that story got like retold in that same area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it, it was fate, just the fact that the story was told, it grew a little bit, got retold in the same area. Mm -hmm. And then my platform grew a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we kept telling the story as the platform grew. But we told the story at, at the platform we were at. Um, and we always left the door open for more. And then it just grew organically uh, to the point where, you know, we connected with some great organizations uh, who helped us grow. Uh, we, and then we got to the point, you know, where I went to big league spring training and the, our manager, Scott Service, wanted to you know, let me tell my story. So now my platform went from being a minor league guy to now I'm telling my story to Robinson Cano and Nelson Cruz and Felix Hernandez, guys who have like financial resources. And, you know, I'm super thankful, grateful to those guys that they wanted to. And so that they wanted to help and they did push us to the next level. And then I went to my second big league spring training and I'm like, we can do something special here. And then that was when we had our first big event. So like, as we we're planning this event, I'm like, this is a lot. But now we're kind of, we kind of have like some security where I can go get somebody to help me. So then we hire Jessica, who's our director now. And she plans this unreal event. Like when I look back on it, if I wouldn't have brought her in, I don't even know if Fort Mom would even be a thing anymore. Like there was so many little details. And so, Jessica comes in, we have this great event, make $35,000 or whatever in one night. And then that pushes us to our next event, next event, next event. Now we're four events in, going into our fifth in March. You know, made all this, these connections. You know, we connected with this company in uh, San Francisco called Savonics, and they're on the cutting edge of research and cognitive health and brain development and trying to. Uh, find out what are the symptoms like when do you start seeing symptoms of Alzheimer's you know and they're creating this app where anybody can take it and it'll help determine okay these are the consistents you know so it's just been crazy like the growth and yeah. seeing how many people I mean to being in northwest Arkansas and having somebody wait outside the locker room in the pouring rain until I come out and they go Braden you don't have a clue who I am, but your story gave me hope. We know what you're going through. 
it, like mm -hmm. that's crazy yeah and like one question i have for you is with your platform and where you're at obviously you want to get your story out there mm -hmm. right because you know it can have that positive effect on others but I'm sure it is uncomfortable at times retelling and telling oh, that yeah. story over and over again, you know? Sure. But do you think that you being open and sometimes like vulnerable about telling that story has given you, I don't want to say um, like uh, uh, some, some semblance of peace that you are able to tell your story and that it's affecting others. Do you think your ability to do that has helped you to cope with the situation and the adversity you've been presented with? For sure. I think that's one of the biggest things is I never had to hold it in. Mm -hmm. I was always given this arena to tell the story instead of like, what would that look like if I just bottled that up yeah. and like couldn't tell anybody? Mm -hmm. You know, because it's one thing when people are like, hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Yeah, surface it's, level. It's like another, when they're like, no, no, really, like, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. How's your mom? How's your dad? How's your family? you know, what's the money situation look like, you know, what's her home look like, whatever it is. So it did, it definitely did give me this like outlet, um, mm -hmm. but it definitely did get tougher. Like as she started getting like progressing and the disease kept getting worse, like to like tell it and know how like brutal it is. Cause like I, you can't like, you know, you, you don't, it's like a disease. So you don't want to like sugarcoat it, but also you don't want to like bring this vibe of like, Oh my God, like I, yeah. I don't like hearing that. Like that's mm -hmm. awful. But, like, it is a brutal disease, and, you know, unfortunately it took her. But, and, like, people say, the crazy thing is about Alzheimer's, like, you love this person, then they're diagnosed, and then you start to, like, learn to love this new person because they turn into a, you know, they, they're forgetting stuff, they're not able to have the freedoms they once had, you know, they can't drive, they struggle to eat, they struggle to speak. So you like learn to love this new person, and then you love, lose them. And so people are like, oh, you know, she's in a better place. And it's like, yes, absolutely, because no one should suffer like that. But like, you said bye to two people. That sucks. Mm -hmm. So it's like the disease is brutal. It, it definitely is. So that's why we're trying to like really push and, mm -hmm. you know, get the awareness and financial resources to people who can make a difference. Yeah. So what, what is your vision like long term for that organization for 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 mom i mean i definitely see like a very big building with hta and, <laughs> and for mom but no i def i actually i every time i pass like a you know a business center on the side of the freeway you know and i see the big glass windows and i see that for mom logo on it like that's where i see us going yeah. you know where hopefully when my brother and i are done playing that can be our focus. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm trying to build it to where like when I'm done, I can just dive into that a hundred percent. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so kind of as we're wrapping up next big event is during spring training. March um, 8th. So can you kind of give details for if anybody's going to be down there and yes. how they can get involved and where they find more info? Yep. So March 8th is a Sunday. Um, 6 to 9 p.m. at Top Golf in Scottsdale. It's a basically like a tournament, a golf tournament, but Top Golf style. So you're not, you know, it doesn't take a ton of effort or energy. And there'll be food and auction items. And, you know, basically, you know, last year we had a lot of baseball players out there, but we weren't trying to get more fans and stuff out mm -hmm. this year. And, uh, uh, our website, formom.org, so the number four mom.org has the sign up. You can RSVP there. Uh, there's You can golf in the tournament. You can just golf to have fun, or you can spectate. Um, so last year we had like 300 people. We were expecting like 100, <laughs> and 300 people came. So That's crazy. Yeah, no, it was really crazy. You guys might have to cap it this year. <laughs> no, serious. Well, that now we have much more space in the Scottsdale one because we had it in Glendale last year. Um, but you know obviously anybody's welcome and mm -hmm. you know everything goes to for mom and our you know our push to connect with researchers and doctors and try and aid them and then a couple more these are just like classic podcast questions Hit that me. i know i know you uh, you've heard before <laughs> on other podcasts so you might have a good answer so if you could prescribe any one habit or any one thing to the world what would it be and why 
prescribe anything to the world? Fish? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's see. Typical. But it, it has to be wild caught. Yeah, wild, absolutely. Let's see. One thing. You know, I think, like, on a very broad scale, positivity. You know, I think... I think positivity is one of the most ultimate healers, mm -hmm. you know, of relationships, you know, even of health, like just yeah. the fact that you change your mindset mm -hmm. and you're in a, I mean, how many times have you seen somebody be in a negative spot and they change their life, whether they get into, they become more spiritual, you know, they, be, they find themselves more so. It's always centered around like a way more positive mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think positivity is, it's invaluable. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we talked about it. You know, being, how good does it feel to be in a positive space and be surrounded by it? You know, like I call it good vibes. You know, like even like I'll watch a movie and it, um, it'll end, I'll be like, God, I have terrible vibes. You know, like, so I think that's something that I would definitely yeah. prescribe. Christmas music and Christmas uh, oh, movies. So good. Actually, good vibes. Good vibes. You sent me that, you sent me that uh, with uh, Trevor Moad, uh, the podcast, and he's, he's Russell's guy. Oh, yeah. And I know Russell a little bit, just being in Seattle. And, and we went to the same church, or we still go to the same church, but Trevor said on the thing that, you know, what was, if you could listen to music, mm -hmm. you know, what music would it be? And he said, well, when I was with Russell, he had worship music on. Yeah. And it's crazy, but like that, the, how, like the vibes that brings, like the positivity, those mm -hmm. words spoken through a song yeah. can totally change the energy. And I thought that was like so cool when I heard that in that podcast. Yeah. And then second one, if you had a time machine, where, what time would you go to? Who would you bring with you and why? Oh, my goodness. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Time. You know, I think, you know, I think it would be to go back to the time, you know, in the Bible where, you know, Jesus walked on the earth. You know, I, I've heard so many times, you know, like we had this big leadership conference with the Mariners a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, one of the questions was, who, who would you like to go back and be with, you know, when they're accomplishing whatever? And a lot of guys, a lot of Christian guys at the conference said Jesus. And, and obviously they couldn't elaborate. But I mean, to like, if you, if you read the Bible, you know, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, the stories in there, I mean, They'll, they'll drop you to your knees. Like, like this is crazy. Like, mm -hmm. the faith these guys had, like, the power in, like, the words. And, like, to actually like, be, like, if you've ever, I haven't, but, like, I know people who have gone to Jerusalem mm -hmm. and, like, walked on those grounds. Yeah. And, like, the power that comes in that, you know, I think to go back to that time and, like, bring as many people as I could, especially people who struggle with, with faith and, like, believing in something, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether they're religious or not, to, like, go back and, like, see the power and, like, belief that, like, these disciples had. I mean, like, people were like, these guys are crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so to, like, bring people, like, I would love to bring my dad or my brother to a time, to that time and, like, mm -hmm. see that. Um, and, you know, my dad and I still, because, you know, my dad grew up Jewish, so that's a lot of old testament mm -hmm. and i always tell my dad like that jesus was jewish like <laughs> like come on let's go <laughs> so but yeah i think like just the the faith that would come out of that mm -hmm. would be unbelievable yeah absolutely if you could only have one pair of shoes for the rest of your life Ooh. you can get you can get a brand new pair whenever you want but it can only be one style and brand Ooh, uh, what are you going with Yes, sir. You seen them? <laughs> Bring out Jordan the 11. Which, which Jordan on 11 Concords. But the the Gamma Blues I like a lot, but I'm definitely a low top guy. So I would. see, and that's why we're such good friends. Yeah, exactly. You know? exactly. That's why we connect at such exactly. a high level. Both Jewish fathers and <laughs> love a good pair of 11s. <laughs> love that. <laughs>
Sweet. So I think that's a wrap on episode one, Strength Roots Podcast. Yes. Appreciate you coming on, Braden. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, go on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter for For Mom. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's the For linked, Mom. Link through all my Instagram, Twitter accounts. So. And what are your accounts? Braden Bishop one on Instagram, Braden Bishop seven on Twitter, and then on Twitter we're For Mom underscore ALZ. And then on Instagram, we're the Four Mom Charity. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can follow us at Hyper Thrive Athletics on Instagram, Facebook. If you guys have any questions, don't fee- don't be afraid to hit us up um, in our DMs. Shoot us a comment, and we will catch you next time. Strength Roots Podcast. The growth starts here. Proceed. Presented by Hyper Thrive Athletics. <laughs> Great job. I love that. How long is it?